Okay, welcome again, everybody. It's 11 a.m., so we're going to start our next PDH uh, session here. We're going to be talking about cooling tower selection and design with Mark Pfeiffer, who's with Marley in Kansas City, Missouri. How are you today, Mark? Doing good. Yourself? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you all again for watching this video uh, will be available at a later date on our YouTube channel, HVAC TV. Uh, that question may come up later, hint, hint. Um, and then it also will be available on our podcast, the Engineers HVAC podcast. So uh, please, you can subscribe to those below if you'd like to watch or listen to this at a later date. Um, so please, we encourage everybody to ask questions in the chat. We will either answer the questions as we go if they're uh, timely, or if it takes a little more time, we'll we'll wait to the end and answer them. But please ask away. Uh, the PDH will be available. I'll tell you how to get that after after the session here. If you were at the first one, you probably already know how to get that. But anyway, I'll tell you at the end here. So, um, okay, Mark, I'm gonna send us into presentation mode and and take it away. All right, thank you, Tony. Um, so yeah, today, uh, welcome. We're going to talk about cooling tower selection and design. Um, and as you guys have already, I guess, seen my introduction, my name is Mark Pfeiffer. I'm with Marley SPX Cooling Tech. Uh, currently manage the application engineering team. I have over 30 years experience in various roles. And I'm currently secretary of ASHRAE TC 8.6. Um, the presentation today, pretty uh, high level overview. Hopefully it's very helpful to, to you folks, uh, kind of geared towards the questions that we get from the field. Um, so basically we just want to help you choose the right cooling tower for your customer's needs. And uh, we want to avoid common mistakes made in the selection and design process. So as a result, it's going to be a little bit of a high level overview. Um, if you look at the agenda day, you might, you might think, wow, that's a lot of content. Um, it is, we're not going to take too deep of a dive into any of these. Um, just a, maybe a reminder or a plug. We have many slide decks that are devoted entirely on some of these topics available on sbxcooling.com. So I encourage you, if there's uh, you know, questions we don't get answered today, if there's more you wanna learn about any of these particular topics, uh, we have uh, webinars, we have white papers, we have a lot of good content on our website, again, at sbxcooling.com. So let's jump in. Uh, we got a lot of content to cover. So just briefly go over you know, a little bit of fundamentals. What is a cooling tower? Um, it is a heat exchanger. It is kind of a unique heat exchanger in that it's a direct heat exchanger where the two fluids are brought into direct contact with one another. Uh, we reject the heat from the process primarily through evaporation. That's what makes it a little bit unique as well. So about 1% of the circulating flow rate um, is, is evaporated for every 10 degree of range. Um, we just have a typical condenser water system shown there. So again, uh, whatever that load is, in this case, probably a, a building load, a cooling load, um, that process heat um, gets sent out to the cooling tower and we reject that heat. So how does the cooling tower itself work? Again, you got hot water coming from your process. Um, it gets distributed over our heat exchange media, which we call fill. Uh, at the same time, we have a fan that is drawing cool, dry air into the unit. That uh, air picks up heat, it picks up moisture, uh, and then the fan discharges that moist, warm air out the top. Uh, cold water is then collected at the bottom of the tower in our collection basin, and then it's sent back to your process. Um, as far as making selections, um, one term that does come up is uh, a, a ton. Uh, we get requests for, hey, we need a we need a quick selection. We need a budget price for a thousand ton, uh, or at least a tower to, to cool a thousand ton chiller. Um, it is a common term in the industry. Uh, just a little bit of background that basically refers to, um, you know, back in the days, you would have a ton of ice. You had the ice plants, and so you'd make a ton of ice. So that's where this 12,000 BTU calculation comes from. That's how much heat you need to remove a ton of water to convert it to a ton of ice. Um, in today's world, with with a uh, chiller system here that we have shown, um, so if you have to remove that 12,000 BTUs, that's what the chiller is doing. Uh, the chiller is also adding additional heat through the compressor. And so we add an additional 3,000 BTUs um, 
to that heat load. And so the cooling tower would actually be rejecting 15,000 BTUs. So this is what we do when we, when, when you guys come to us and say, hey, you need a thousand ton uh, cooling tower, we're looking at 15,000 BTUs. So methodology um, is fine from initial selections for budget requests, get initial layouts and, and size of cooling towers. However, it is common um, to actually use these types of selection terms. This, uh, when you use flow rate, hot water and cold water, then we have an actual wet or we have an actual heat load. When you look at it from a ton standpoint, today's chillers are much more efficient. They're not necessarily adding 3000 BTUs. So you probably have a little bit of pad in your selection, which is okay. But if you really wanna dial into a selection, um, we typically would recommend that you're gonna use these types of selection terms. Um, in addition to those terms that, that are in that box, we have wet bulb and then we calculate range and that's your difference between your hot water and your cold water. And then the approach temperature is the difference between your cold water temperature and your wet bulb. Now, one common question we get is, hey, um, the tower's not uh, cooling the range. We're only, we're only getting an eight degree range. And that's because in that situation, there may not be a full heat load. If your design heat load is 10 degrees, but there's only an eight degree range on the tower, basically that means you have an 80% heat load. So just a reminder that cooling range is determined by the process. The, the, the cooling tower has nothing to do with that. What the cooling tower does determine is your approach temperature. So if you wanna get colder and colder water, closer and closer to that wet bulb temperature, that is due to the size and the ability of that cooling tower. Um, as far as wet bulb temperature, that's hopefully determined by nature. Uh, in some cases, we'll talk about recirculation. If you're getting some recirculation occurring, that wet bulb temperature may be artificially raised, uh, but hopefully it is a nice, fresh uh, ambient air wet bulb that's getting pulled into the cooling tower. Um, as far as some relationships go, uh, what happens as we try to provide colder and colder water? Um, there is a cost impact associated with that as one would understand, but in this case, it can grow rather quickly. So most of our users, most of our customers would look to maybe have a five to seven degree approach temperature. Um, however, there are some users that are very interested in energy efficiency. Um, and we'll talk about some of the benefits of colder water, but um, those users may go to four and even three degree approach temperatures. Uh, you can see by this diagram here that that will cost them. There is additional capital that's required, um, but in the case of maybe a data center, they're very interested in, in getting highest efficiency as possible. So uh, we often sell uh, towers even in those tight approach temperatures. Another important relationship is tower size versus efficiency. So we're kind of unique in the fact that we can kind of give you about any type of efficiency that you want. Um, it's, there's a nice relationship with the size of the unit, the amount of heat exchange material and the airflow that goes across it. So if you want the most economical tower, it usually, or it oftentimes would be the smallest selection. And I have a, an example here where the uh, 8405, that first row, that is our smallest box for this given duty that'll perform the duty, happens to be 40 horsepower, and uh, that is gonna be your cheapest model. And so we have the ability to upsize the unit. We can go to an 8407, so that seven represents the physical size. Um, when we do that, then you're gaining efficiency and, uh, and you're lowering your, your air requirement through there. And so we don't need as large of a motor, and so your ash rate efficiency uh, goes up. So we have this nice ability to do this. So many users consider maybe upsizing their unit by one physical size. So that is a nice uh, benefit there. Hey, Mark, if you were to send that <clears throat> option to an engineer, and I know I've done this in the past, what percentage would pick the most efficient <clears throat> versus smallest versus middle of the road? Is, is, it, is there a big one way or the other, or is it? I would say, you know, maybe five, 10, 15 years ago, uh, a lot of people talked about wanting efficiency, but, and we quoted a lot of the more efficient models, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, they tended to pick the, the most economical. I think that trend is continuing. Uh, people are understanding the benefits. Um, certainly, you know, just from a greenhouse gas emissions, things like that, getting a more efficient, you know, whether it's a cooling tower or other equipment, uh, that's how you achieve mm -hmm. those, those goals. So, um, that that tide is shifting. So we do sell quite a few 
uh, higher efficient models. So that doesn't necessarily give you an actual number, but uh, definitely a trend going towards, you know, like in this example, I would say we would consider, or many users would purchase that 8407 as mm -hmm. opposed to the 8405. Yeah, I, um, I just have learned, like, it's so dangerous to pick the smallest of anything that's right on the edge. It's, just, yeah, it's always nice to have that little bit of extra capacity. So. Yeah, and, and one thing, I'll bring it up. If you are designing a system that has maybe a redundant cell, then you can technically you can buy this 8405 but if you're going to have an additional cell mm -hmm. um, you just operate with that additional cell and so in essence you're kind of getting mm. an 8407 so that's that's just a nice little method right to, yeah to have to have redundancy to be able to use that surface area to achieve the sound reduction that we have listed here mm -hmm. um, and then of course you've got you know if you do lose something if you lose a motor or your mechanical equipment or something goes down or if you need you could still operate at the lower yeah gotcha mm -hmm. yeah and of course when you're doing that then it's just for a short period mm -hmm. and uh that method also works well for for even sound targets if you've got a really tough sound project if you have some redundancy in there um we were we've been able to meet some sound criteria that way you know they've got a targeted sound level at night uh, when the wet bulb is low you don't have to run the fans as fast, and so you get sound reductions there. And then if you're able to use that redundant cell, then you can slow the fans down even more. So just a nice, um, you know, it's a nice method from a design standpoint. If people are using or considering redundant cells or requiring redundant cells, mm -hmm. make sure to incorporate using that redundant cell and not keeping it idle. I love it. Yeah, and Rob, uh... Rob P, thank you for the comment. He said, if it's a replacement tower, your tower enclosure clearances can be an issue too. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. And any comments or questions, we'd love to hear them. So, yeah. Cool. And I, thank you, Mark. Uh, you know, again, on the cost perspective, as you see, the tower box gets bigger. So the cost mm -hmm. will go up. Um, but again, it's just a, it's a matter of, of doing the analysis to see um, if that's worth your, your effort and your. Yeah. Your the engineering trade offs. With any piece of HVAC equipment, there's no ideal, you know. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Well, let's uh, let's jump ahead. Let's look at installation and location. Um, and I, I can't remember which user mentioned that, but yeah, you want to make sure that your enclosure uh, requirements are, are looked at for replacement projects. Um, so cooling towers bring in lots of fresh air. Um, and again, we want that fresh air to be fresh and not, not uh, the discharge air that comes out of the top. And so we want to make sure that the unit um, is spaced uh, away from a enclosure wall, if there is going to be one. Uh, this example here, uh, this is an enclosure that has louvers on the bottom portion. So it, it's probably a good installation. Now, if it was enclosed, if it was a solid wall there on the left side of that photograph, might be a little bit tight. And so if that is the case, then you may have more air that needs to be pulled down from up above. And of course, the air that's up above could potentially be that discharge air that's that's coming out of the unit. And so you just wanna make sure that there's enough space for that unit um, to enable fresh air coming in and at, at reasonable velocities. And we have the minimum enclosure clearances. Uh, they are listed on our data sheets that, that, are, that come out of our selection tool. Um, along with that, um, just note the direction of prevailing winds. You know, if the tower is going to be up against a building, um, hopefully the prevailing wind is not blowing the discharge into that building because then th the discharge has nowhere to go. Um, hopefully the prevailing wind is blowing it away from the unit, not into some sort of um, you know, building or something that's going to, again, promote recirculation. Um, certainly air intakes, uh, you don't want to discharge the, the cooling tower air it back into your building. It's very humid. Um, potentially could have uh, Legionella in it. So you, we want to make sure that that is not the case. Um, in this picture, again, uh, this cooling tower installation is not completed. I would expect that there's going to be some fan cylinder segments added to the top uh, to make sure that the discharge is at or above that enclosure wall. So again, um, you know, people don't usually want to see the cooling tower. They want to hide it behind an enclosure wall, which is fine. You just want to make sure that that wall is not too tall and now your tower is you know in a in a deep well where it can't get that fresh air and and from a recirculation standpoint important to have that discharge air up up close to that um, top of the wall 
And of course, one last thing, and we'll cover this later on in the presentation, but you wanna make sure there's space for piping as well as maintenance. Um, some, some installations can be quite crowded, so I just wanna account for that. That way there's methodologies to service your equipment. Uh, it's one common good reminders for sure. Yeah. Uh, one question we get a lot about is, hey, what's what's the best tower as far as tower types go to fit into an enclosure? Um, the perception seems to be out there that counterflow is often smaller, um, which can be true in some cases, but not always the case. So I think that the takeaway with the next few slides here is that it kind of depends on your installation, uh, depends on your duty and, and what kind of box size we're getting into. Um, the crossflow tower, it basically has two inlets, uh, one on the left, one on the right, where you're bringing that fresh air in. Your counterflow has four air inlets typically. Um, and so a little more square shaped versus rectangular. So that may play into your, your layout at your site. Um, if it's smaller tonnages, less than 750, then counterflow can sometimes have an advantage on footprint. Um, but if you look at the, the, in, the air inlet that's coming in, uh, that advantage may or may not still occur. Um, when you get above 750 tons, that's when generally the crossflow tower, we will add an additional module to the upper portion, in other words, a double decker. And so the footprint advantages um, jump ahead with your crossflow at higher tonnages. Now, as a trade-off to that, when we jump to those larger tonnages and we put the double decker on there, that's where your height, um, your height mm -hmm. advantage is at low, um, tonnages on the cross flow would then flip back to counter flow. So again, the advantage really depends on the job requirements. So that's just something mm -hmm. to consider as you're making uh, your decisions on what type of towers um, to select. You learn that early in the industry as an answer. It depends, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't like giving that as, as an answer, but you know, sometimes it is the correct answer. And uh, if you do have a, you know, a given project, then we won't, hopefully be giving you that answer. We'll be telling you, hey, this is what we think is, my, is the you best. You know, my solution. wife asked me a question recently and I went through the different, you know, the the all the parameters and she's like, can't you just give me an answer? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the engineer yeah. in us, I guess. As engineers, we're not, <laughs> we're not the best at, at giving concise right, answers. Uh, this yeah. is great info. Thank you, Mark. You're doing great. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, so next let's look a little bit at system optimization uh, as far as uh, just from an energy and, and water standpoint to make sure that we're on the right track. Um, some questions we get is, hey, you know, why use evaporative? Why not just go to dry cooling? Um, and this kind of goes back to some of the fundamentals. Uh, dry cooling, um, you know, it is a little bit simpler. You don't have water to mess with. There's no freezing, um, no water treatment, uh, but the energy efficiency takes a, a huge hit. So um, the, the big impact or the, the driver with dry cooling is it's sensible cooling only. And so if we have one pound of water and you cool at one degree Fahrenheit, you're removing one BTU. If you take that same one pound of water and you evaporate it, you're removing almost 1000 BTUs. So when you go to evaporative cooling, the heat rejection capabilities is so much larger. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one important element. So just the, the simple act of getting rid of that heat, we are much more efficient. So that's one, one item. The other item is what is your process doing? What temperatures is your process going to get back? So in this case, if you have a 95 degree day, you're not gonna provide 85 degree cold water back to your process loop with a dry cooler. It's gonna be more like, you know, 100, 105, 100, 110 degrees. And so the process is gonna see much warmer temperatures as a result. Um, with evaporative cooling, the wet bulb is a driving force and that, that, that's a lower temperature than your dry bulb. And so again, on that 95 degree day, we're able to provide you know, say 85 degree cold water. And that's another big benefit yeah. of evaporative cooling. Mark, give the viewers one or two examples of why you would use it. What do you see dry cooling typically and what kind of applications these days? Is there any major like broad reaching application you see those in typically or? Well, um, certainly, you know, one thing, water generally is is cheap from an economic standpoint. It's hard to justify dry cooling, but when you don't have water or if you don't have enough water, mm. um, that's when, you know, if you cannot use evaporative cooling, uh, that's when dry cooling would be uh, would be selected. Gotcha. Um, when water is a premium. Yeah. And there, you know, depending on the tonnages, um, there has been a uh, maybe a shift at lower tonnages. Um, 
if you've got a smaller installation where people want to have less maintenance, again, less water treatment needs, things like that, um, and they're willing to take that hit on energy efficiency, um, that's when they'd be switching to dry cooling. So, gotcha. Um, I guess a good reminder, uh, ASHRAE Journal, the last uh, version, uh, November 2022, uh, Ken Mortensen here at SPX Cooling Technology, he's also the uh, president of, of Cooling Technology Institute. Um, he did write an article on, on just the evaporative cooling's efficiency uh, value. It also talks about just the actual water savings that, that often occurs, which is counterintuitive to most people. They think, okay, your cooling tower is going to use much more water, um, but that that dry cooler that takes a lot more energy, and depending on where your energy is coming from, you may have uh, higher water usage at the power plant. You know, most mm -hmm. uh, still a, a very large portion of our power grid today. You know, we made great strides moving towards uh, renewables, but we still have a long ways to go, and so oftentimes there is still a lot of water consumed at your power plant. So. Um, again, just reference that uh, ASHRAE Journal article. Uh, it was just in last month's um, article, and it's uh, November 2022. Thank you, so, Mark. All right. And I, you know, just in the interest of time, quickly, here is a uh, just an example. Um, again, I think everybody understands energy consumption. You have energy costs that go down with evaporative cooling. Greenhouse gases, you know, emissions goes down as well. What's counterintuitive is that total water usage. And so here, if you look at the system and the community, that's where, again, depending on your location, how your energy is, is produced, um, you could have water savings by using water-cooled system. And again, I'll just refer you to that ASHRAE article for, for more information there. All right, so from a, from a System optimization energy standpoint, uh, let's look at some relationships. Uh, this one is fairly simple. What happens when we use a VFD? We slow the fans down, uh, roughly 50% fan speed. We still provide 50% performance. So simple relationship uh, when you begin to slow down the fans. Uh, the benefit though, is that when you slow it down to 50%, you're only using one eighth of horsepower. So big energy savings there. Mm -hmm. uh, commonly understood, I think, in the industry, widely accepted. Uh, VFDs, you know, fortunately are used on a majority of the projects today. Um, many other benefits of using VFDs, you know, just me your mechanical equipment lasts longer. Uh, sound reductions is a big one. You know, even if you're even if you're switching from lower speed up to high speed, um, usually it's going to ramp up. So, you know, users or neighbors wouldn't necessarily notice the differences in and in, in the sound levels so right that just, big on and off changes sound is what yeah yep you changes, don't get yeah. that that impact so um so that's that's one of the things that's nice if if your process doesn't necessarily benefit from colder water then you want to start slowing your fan down um, however most processes do benefit from colder water so you want to look at what the process what the energy consumption is so in a chiller application, usually that chiller uses a lot more energy or it, it, it always does than the cooling tower. So typically as your heat load goes down or as the wet bulb temperature starts to drop, we would recommend that you continue to operate your fan at high speed and provide colder water back to your process loop. Um, chillers save one to 3% KW per ton per degree reduction. So again, they will benefit from colder water. A um, question we do get is, well, what should our cold water set point be? You know, should it be 70, 75? What's the answer? It really depends, again, um, on your chiller manufacturer. Uh, they, different manufacturers, their technologies benefit a little bit differently. So you may have one unit that you want to operate at 75, another unit maybe you want to run at 70 or, or even 65. Um, so I recommend talking to the chiller manufacturers for that optimal cold water set point. Good, thank you, Mark. And I did get a few. Um, <clears throat> Let me make sure I got my email right here. So USA.com. So I'm putting my email in the chat. If you want a copy of the ASHRAE article that Mark's referencing, Mark, if you can, I don't know how ASHRAE works, if they let us let you distribute that because you're the publisher of it or not. Um, if you can just send it to me and then I'll, if you all who are watching want a copy of it, email me and I'll, I'll refer you to it. Yeah. I, um, it is copyrighted, but we did purchase some, some copies from ASHRAE. Um, okay. So they are available. 
Great. Um, yeah. yeah, just email me, y'all. Uh, my there's my you know mountain accent coming out. Y'all, y'all could email me up here <laughs> in the mountains. Um, T Mormino at InsightUSA.com. Uh, we did get a question too, Mark. Real quick, we got uh, Sean Elliston is asking, um, "What is being referenced for water cooled using less water than air cooled?" Uh, maybe that's your previous slide. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, and this this slide, I guess, a reference. Um, um, I'm just trying to think here. What this is this? Was an old? Yeah, this was an old uh, Buildings Magazine article. Uh, the the more recent ASHRAE journal article it does reference the uh, the power consumption where that comes from and that is much more recent. Um, just looking at it, it is based on April 2021 data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. So, in other words, if if you are consuming more energy, um, the power plant, you know, may be using water as well. And what this article goes into is is that relationship in the grid. So renewable energy in this is only at 12 percent for the U.S. as of 2020. And again, we've made great strides gotcha. changing that. There's plans to continue to change that. Um, um, but at least in today's world and in the near term, you're still um, power plants are still using quite a bit of water. And of course, we know mm -hmm. that we, we also provide cooling towers at the power plant level as well. And that is, you know, one of the consumers of, of water at the power plant is your is your use of boilers and then and then of course the cooling towers. Excellent. Yeah, and just so everybody, just to clarify, the the water versus air cooled is talking about the you know evaporatively cooled cooling tower versus a closed loop cooling tower, not that not referring to the air cooled or water cooled Schiller, correct? Um, it is referring to the to, to the, the cooling the, tower. No, to the chiller. In other words, um, Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I'm glad I clar uh, you clarified that for me too. Okay. So water cooled versus air cooled chiller efficiency. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Sean, for the question. Okay. Getting back to where we were at. So another yeah. methodology um, for saving energy. Uh, we talked earlier about that relationship between surface area and airflow. And so, uh, and this kind of plays into that redundant cell. And again, we have a whole nother slide deck and white papers on this topic, but we would encourage users to implement what's called variable flow. And so as your heat load begins to come down, um, the old methodology was to turn off a cooling tower cell. If you had a multi-cell installation, uh, what this does is say, okay, you can, you can turn off a chiller or you can turn off part of your process load, uh, but continue to use all the cells that you have available. So the limitation of using all those cells that are available is can it handle the flow rates? And so if you turn off a chiller, you're likely going to be reducing your flow rate from your, your condenser water loop. Well, we would encourage you to continue to flow all that water over all cells that are available. And the methodology to do that is to use what we call these uh, nozzle cups. And we place these into the cooling tower in the distribution basin. And that allows us to handle lower flow rates in that cooling tower cell while maintaining adequate water distribution. Uh, we want to promote good water distribution on the outboard edge, and that way you have you know, uniform air side pressure drop. You have um, the ability to minimize scale and to minimize any icing because you've got adequate water distribution. Um, and this slide just kind of highlights how that works in a cross flow arrangement. Uh, the diagram on the left, again, you're, you're promoting water distribution on the outboard edge and the inboard edge is where that water um, is not being distributed. And so as air comes in, it picks up heat, it picks up moisture. You're mostly doing that latent or evaporative cooling on the outboard edge. As you get towards the inboard, um, there's a little more sensible cooling um, because that air again is, is nearly saturated. And so if you don't have water on that inboard edge, you do not have icing and scaling concerns there. And that's, that's kind of the premise of that that design. Um, counterflow towers, a little more challenging. Uh, they don't have nozzle cup type technology. It's a pressurized spray system. And so typically the nozzles are either going to do what's shown here. If you're at a lower flow, you're just not going to get as good water distribution. Uh, the other methodology is to change out your nozzles so you can get adequate water distribution. 
but then those nozzles are going to be smaller and so at full flow rate um, there's a big um, increase in uh, head pressure that's required to pump water through that distribution system so counterflow not quite as um, the solution is not as elegant uh, you get this big energy trade-off to be able to enable low flow mm -hmm. so um, this is a, a widely understood, um, at least in the industries. Uh, Title 24 requires this out in California, which doesn't necessarily you know, pertain to you guys. Uh, but ASHRAE 90.1 also recognizes this and requires it in some operating scenarios. So a good method. Again, you know that surface area is already purchased. It's out there. The capital investment's been made. If you've got it available to you, take advantage of that. And that way we can minimize um, tower energy at this point by using absolutely um, excellent info mark we have a couple other questions from uh, one from jeffrey michael um he's referring to variable condenser flow towers here's the question are weir dams not recommended anymore uh weir dams is a solution that was kind of the uh, i won't say old school but that was the methodology that we used to use um, if you look at this diagram if you put in a weir um, a weir dam, it goes into the page, and so you could only eliminate an entire row. Uh, with nozzle cups, we can dial in more specific flow rates that we're trying to get to, so they're a little more flexible from a from a specific flow rate that's required. So weir, weir dams can cool. work. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jeffrey, Michael, for the question. We have another question here. Um, by Rodrigo. Thank you very much. What control mechanisms do you recommend to balance stop, balance operating a spare cell for energy efficiency and not going below the minimum flow rate? Um, that's more a matter of, I guess, identifying what the minimum flow rates that that cell can can accommodate. Uh, that is a question we get, you know, at the at the quote and submittal stage is what is the lowest flow? Um, and most people will design for fifty percent. Uh, but others, you know, they can go down to 40, 30, even in the 20% range. So it's just a matter of knowing what that minimum flow rate is and then making sure your sequence of operation is correct. In other words, um, let's say it's a four chiller installation. You have four cells. If the unit can't handle 25%, then you may have to only operate three cells at that point. So it's just kind of understanding at one point as the flow goes down, where does that water need to be pumped? And um, so that, that that just needs to be thought out ahead of time. And that way, when the, when the flow rates do drop as, as chillers come offline, you know which cells are gonna be open and which cells are gonna be you know closed or unavailable from a valve standpoint. Um, at, the tower, at the tower itself, um, you know, the question didn't really ask this, but one nice thing about this feature, um, there's no changes at the tower. If you go into full flow rate, these nozzle cups are flooded. And so the operator does Mark is frozen up here just for a sec. Hopefully. <laughs> this happens from time to time. Just hang on. It'll, we'll get him back on here in just a second. Live streaming takes quite a few, uh, quite a lot of bandwidth. Mark, we got you back. Thank you, sir. Can you hear us okay? Yes, okay. Yep. No problem. That happens all the time when you're live streaming. We got you back. So okay, I didn't know where where I lost you. I don't know. <laughs> did I did I answer that last question? I guess you did. Yeah, Rodrigo okay. says thank you, and we okay. you were only gone for a couple seconds. So thank you so okay. much. Okay, all right, excellent job. So. Great. Okay. Well, the next uh, brief topic, is just from an energy and a design standpoint, is to implement free cooling, uh, known widely, maybe more widely in the industry as water side economizing. Uh, I know this, you know, there's decisions to be made whether you would use this versus maybe air side economizing. Um, I'm not sure I'm prepared to answer questions on why you would use one versus the other. I would refer to ASHRAE for that. Um, but if you do go to water side economizing, basically this is just a method where the cooling tower can provide cold enough water back to your process so that you can hopefully either turn the chillers off or you can at least supplement the the work that the chiller does do. And if you look at this example, uh, the chiller does use more horsepower than your cooling tower and your condenser water pumps. 
So anytime you can start to begin turning chillers off and, and servicing that need for cold water with a cooling tower, um, that is always a, a good thing. The big driver with this is just total number of hours out of a year. Um, in your guys' climate, you're kind of in that, probably in that, um, you may not get as many hours as certainly as people to the north of you. So this may not be as common in your region, but it's something to consider. Um, and when you do do your initial design, if you're looking at free cooling, um, some users just look at their standard low cost selection, and then they see what they can get out of the tower in the winter time. Um, another method is to say, you know what, maybe I do need to upsize and get a tower that can get a little bit, provide a little bit colder water um, during the winter time. In other words, let your winter design case control. And that way they can um, enable it to get more more hours of operation in the winter time during freight cooling. And again, more information awesome. is available out in the industry on this topic. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sound. This one's very important. Uh, comes up more and more. Um, if you haven't worked on a sound sensitive project yet, then uh, my guess is you will soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then and then for the next five years, you'll be very sensitive to all acoustical considerations. <laughs> yeah. And this one's this one's important because, you know, the tough ones to solve on sound are the ones that weren't thought about in the beginning. Oh uh, you gosh. get out to the yeah. site, you know, the equipment's too loud. What can you do now? So now you're having to upgrade, replace, you know, yeah. that's that's a more expensive solution. Pretty, right? pretty easy to easy to address on paper, that's for sure. Yes, much easier to address on paper in the in the design stage. Yeah. So we have primary sources of sound, pretty uh, well understood. I think the, your your mechanical equipment is generally the driver. You know, it's rotating equipment, moving a lot of air. So typically, that's what's contributing the most and looked at the most for for sound reduction. Um, the air inlet as well, uh, the falling water noise can be uh, something to consider. Um, you know, as you get into the larger field erected towers that, that may flip on you because they do have a lot of water noise. But in the package towers, uh, not quite as much. Uh, the counterflow tower is a little bit at a disadvantage when it comes to sound noise. There is water that falls off the bottom of that fill there um, and into mm -hmm. the basin. Um, but fortunately, that does attenuate with distance. So if you've got a property line sound requirement, you know, that generally is maybe not what's the big contributor. Uh, there is also sound attenuation that's available for the counterflow tower that's fairly economical um, to take care of that falling water noise. Um, other differences between these two towers, I guess, the cross flow, you can see it's only got two air inlets. So you do have a case face. Um, so it'll be a little bit of a quieter side to the tower as opposed to the inlet side. The counterflow tower, that's not necessarily the case because you've got air inlets on all four sides. So this is your least contrib contributors, the sources of sound. So what do we do when we have a sound sensitive project? What's the sound mitigation techniques? Uh, just going over some obvious ones. Um, if you're able to locate the tower further away, okay, that's that one's kind of a simple one, but uh, but again, you know, if you've got a, a property line, then ideally yeah. you don't put your 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 mechanical equipment close to that property line. So that one's kind of a maybe a no-brainer. Um, number one, this one isn't as well understood, but orient the case face of your cross flow towards a receiver. You know, if you're if you're close, um, that may be all the trick you need to do to to get that sound requirement met. Uh, number three, again, this goes back to that. Um, energy efficiency one, oversize a tower and run at reduced fan speed. Um, you know, you're going to have a, a lower or a smaller motor typically. Um, fans typically going to run a little bit slower. So um, that's a very popular method because you've got mm -hmm. other benefits as well. So when those things don't work, or if perhaps you're in a, a tight location where you can't physically make the tower larger or taller, then you want to look at the fan options. So typically we just add additional fan blades that helps a two to three dB. Uh, if that doesn't quite do it, we look at the fan that's listed there in the, in the photograph at the bottom, very wide cord, ultra quiet fan, uh, very popular option. Um, just a really, <laughs> it's, it's a fan that's it's interesting one to see and, and try to hear, I guess, at, at the job installation. So those are the those are the popular options. Uh, if you have a really tough requirement, we get into attenuation. 
Um, the photograph there on the bottom, if you look at the uh, blue logos on the left and the right, that's kind of your standard arrangement. So we have actually bolted two foot uh, modules. So there's two modules on each side. Uh, so this is a total of four foot air inlet attenuation. So incredibly quiet sound requirements on this project. Um, so that is available. Uh, another one, another solution is to place a barrier wall between the tower and the receiver. Uh, you know, if you've got an existing building or wall, then that, that may be convenient. Uh, but if you had to build a brand new wall just for sound, that's going to be somewhat expensive, right? It's kind of like the ones you see next to the highway. So, right. Great info. Uh, Mark, I have a quick question here from Steve Clankson, the one and only Steve Clankson. Um, always intrigued by some published data that reflects lower sound levels than our towers when the fan is actually off or running at a reduced speed. Does the physics of sound vary? Does anyone else publish certified data? Um, uh, thanks for that question, Steve. Um, I think there was a little tone of, uh, <laughs> of uh, aggression, not aggression. What was it? Sarcasm yeah. maybe in there? I'm not really sure. Yeah. Without, without getting too, um, I don't know, uh, too much on our, put our sales hats on here. The, the, the question kind of alludes to, and, and I will get to that here on the next slide, actually. So maybe, uh, Let's just hold it. that question. So just your sound reduction table there. Some people get confused by that. But as you're on the left side, uh, that's kind of your lower cost, lower effort. And as you go up on the sound reduction, I mean, you guys probably understand this, but so it kind of varies a little bit with what are these mitigation techniques you have as to the benefit and, of course, the cost and the effort. So, okay, now back to Steve's question. Yes, um, there is some variance in the sound data that is published out in the marketplace. Um, CTI, which is the Cooling Technology Institute, they do have a sound test code. So that is the methodology for, for uh, doing the test. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the sound that's published is certified. Uh, so CTI currently does not certify sound. Um, the industry is working towards that, but they are not there today. So um, I'd say your sound data may vary by manufacturer, I'll put it that way. Um, SBX Marley, we do certify our sound through a third party. Um, so we stand behind our sound values. So as a result, sometimes we get some interesting looking sound mm -hmm. data from some of the other manufacturers. So if you've got a sound sensitive project and you want to make sure the neighbors are happy at the end of your project, um, encourage you to to request um, sound that has been looked at by a, by a third party. Mm -hmm. um, just I a agree. quick. Just a quick, uh, that, that sound code has been revised here not too long ago, November 2019. So if you have specifications, uh, we just recommend referencing the latest version. Um, again, that way we, we're publishing at least data that matches, um, that's reflective of the latest code version. They, they kind of tinkered with the sound power calculations. So the sound power numbers did change um, with this revision. So make sure to include that in your specification. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. Well, speaking of regulations and codes, um, I want to talk a little bit about those as well, because that's something that comes into play as far as the design. I mentioned CTI already. Um, so most of the products for the HVC type market, light industrial, uh, I should say most of the factory assembled products are going to be certified for thermal performance per CTI standard 201. And as a result, uh, from a design or a spec requirement, there's really no need to, to uh, require thermal performance tests. Uh, we see specifications on that occasionally. Uh, we always take exception to that. Um, some users are saying, hey, I, we need that. It's just part of what we do. That is an expensive test. It's a little harder to actually go and, and verify performance. And that's, of course, why CTI was created in the first place. We wanted to make it easier for uh, designers, certainly the end users, to not have to go through the troubles of a performance test. Um, CTI, they send a representative to our R&D center every summer, and they pick a model out of every one of our product lines to verify performance. So it's a constant certification program uh, that the manufacturers follow. So if a tower is certified for CTI standard 201, you can be rest assured that the performance is going to be there. So. 
make sure that that is included. Um, there's other building codes and other design criteria to include. IBC is common. Uh, I, I suppose you guys wouldn't really get into OSHPOD. That's your California healthcare uh, requirements. Florida building code, I assume this one uh, does come up for you that the design into the Florida region. Um, they certainly have wide, high wind requirements. And so we just ask that um, as design engineers, you guys determine the wind pressure for the manufacturers to uh, to meet. Sometimes we get kind of loosey goosey wind speed, mm -hmm. kind of you know just just not real definitive uh, requirements. And uh, as a result, then it's up to the manufacturers to kind of make assumptions and do their own calculations. And so you know results may vary type of deal. Um, so if you provide a wind pressure, then it's up for us to just say, hey, here is a model that meets your, your wind pressure requirement. Um, gotcha. Another thing to watch out for, um, when we are upgrading towers to meet high wind pressure, certainly in Florida, um, depending on the requirement, they can be fairly costly upgrades. So we wanna ensure that uh, the user is, they either justify or wanna get that higher cost unit um, the example here with this photograph, um, if this was a commercial office building, uh, maybe it's not so important that after a high wind event that the air conditioning works, or at least it works immediately after that event. So that that's one where we would recommend an Anchorage only type high wind design. And that way, um, we're just ensuring that the tower is not going to you know, come off its, its steel supporting steel structure. Now, if that was serving a, a hospital emergency room, then yeah, you would want that tower to be operating. That's what's considered your structural design. So now Mark, in some you region, know, uh, Paul Holloway was asking what happened in that picture. Was that a hurricane? Um, you know, or? this, you know, I don't actually know the backstory on this. Um, I, I do know that, that obviously <laughs> those cars were affected, but the towers are still up there. So, um, it's just, a, just a, yeah. it's just an example of, of, yeah, of an event. Some sort of an event that was unpleasant. Yeah. Sorry, so I don't know the people. backstory. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Paul, for the comment, though. Yeah. The question. Okay. So, again, things to watch out for, just hopefully define wind pressure for us, and then think about whether, and again, the, the structure and anchorage sometimes go back to your importance factor. Um, if, you know, hospital, things like that are fairly well known. Um, some other customers, maybe um, there's no regulations that dictate it be. Uh, a high importance factor, but maybe a data center says, hey, you know, yeah, we can we can shut down after a, an event, but we have customers that require us to be up and running. So those would be designs that, that may be structure or, or a high importance factor as dictated by the customer instead of the, uh, the regulatory mm -hmm. body. It's okay. Uh... All right, next one is water quality and treatment. This is very brief. I know most design engineers are like that's that's going to be the one. This is making sure that that is in play. Um, if you're the installing contractor, uh, make sure that water quality and treatment is is part of that um, initial startup and maybe that first year of operation uh, while it's under your care before you hand it off to the owner. Just make sure that that piece is being taken care of. And so we just want to look at, you know, just some basics. Why water treatment? Uh, there's two main goals. You want to protect. Mark, we lost you again. Uh, please stand by if you're watching. All right, you're back. Go for it. Okay. We got you. Did, uh, okay. Well, I don't know what, how we much I you. lost. Just for a two couple seconds, you're good. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. um, so the next one is just protect the materials in your process water. You got the cooling tower, you've got piping, and most importantly, you've got maybe a chiller or some sort of expensive um, process equipment. You just wanna make sure that the water treater is taking care of those alloys. And the way in which they do that, basically they have three to four basic components. They have inhibitors to prevent scale precipitation. Um, the cooling tower you know, does evaporate water and so um, solids can begin to to build up um, or or at least elevate as far as dissolve solids. And so they they would provide inhibitors to make sure that scale does not form 
you know, whether in the cooling tower or in your, uh, your heat exchange coils or, or plates. Uh, they would provide inhibitors to protect against corrosion. Again, you want to keep that, uh, you know, if you got copper and, and carbon steel, you want to keep that stuff um, protected so it has a long service life. Uh, you want biocides. And then most often we would recommend people would implement some sort of solids reduction. If you have a, a filtration system, a sweeper system to keep your suspended solids in suspension, and then those can be removed, then the top three, your inhibitors and your biocides can function much more efficiently if they don't have to um, try to get through the muck. Uh, let's say high sediment is in there, then those inhibitors have a harder time protecting an alloy if, if it can't get to it. Um, just a, a quick plug, these are some options we have to help with the water treatment. So maybe as a design engineer, this is something you can specify. Uh, we do get pipe scale that comes out of the pipe sometimes after operation. You can see that in the top left photograph. So we've got a nice filtration option on the bottom left. Um, even as that pipe scale begins to form and settle out on that filter, we still have good water distribution across all our nozzles. Uh, sweeper piping is shown on the bottom right. Again, that's just a way to keep the suspended solids um, moving and not settling at the cooling tower basin. And then that way it can then be sent to a through a filtration or separator type system. Okay, next we just want to talk a little bit about uh, durability and maintenance. Uh, there's a number of options um, in this. So just talking through some of them. So there's a lot of different mechanical uh, options, belt drive, mm -hmm. gear drive, EC motors, PM motors. Um, what's best, what's, what's, you know, what should we be using? Mm -hmm. um, Marley traditionally has been a, a gear reducer type company. Very proud of our, of our gear reducer. It's got a five-year warranty on it, five-year oil changes. So from a maintenance standpoint, um, there's really minimal uh, maintenance requirements. Uh, belt drive, you know, those need tightening, they need changing. Um, EC motors gaining in popularity. Um, right now, there is some supply chain challenges with that technology, unfortunately, um, but those are gaining in popularity. Uh, the PM motor, certainly more interest. Uh, that's that bottom right photograph. Um, so that technology, there is no need for, it kind of combines a motor and a gearbox into one. Uh, it's basically running at, at the speed that you need it. So that uh, does offer some maintenance advantages, um, but it does come at a fairly high premium as far as cost goes. So encourage you, uh, kind of, you know, it's another one of those, it depends, is it worth your mm -hmm. um, investment? Um, the big thing from a, maybe from a technology, from a, the, putting my application engineer hat on, just from a solution standpoint, if you've got a tall building, and you use this PM motor, just ensure that there's a way for you to remove that motor. Um, it quickly runs into some very high weights. And so a lot of our Davit options, whether it's our standard Davit, uh, we also have a heavy Davit option. I believe at 60 horsepower, that motor exceeds the cap the capabilities of those Davits. So mm, um, keep that in if, mind. If you don't have a crane accessible, Well, give this just a second. Yeah, so if you need an EC motor, if you if you don't want to wait, if you have a lead time issue, don't specify an EC motor. That's what I'm hearing. Um, we'll give Mark just a second to get back here. Hopefully, we'll get him back this time. Here he is. All right, we got you, Mark. Okay. You 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 were finishing up on that slide, so thank you. Yeah, so again, there's trade-offs. Just encourage you to evaluate yep. those accordingly. Okay, um, looks like we are definitely getting into some time crunch here. So I probably want to, um, I guess, get through these this last little bit. From a durability standpoint on materials, um, galvanized steel, very economical, uh, still a popular choice. Um, in your region, my suspicion, uh, maybe sell a little more stainless steel I would encourage you, even if you've got a tower that you're wanting to save money on, a big push for, for some value engineering. Uh, perhaps you get a galvanized tower, but I would encourage you to consider um, putting a stainless cold water basin on the unit. 
Um, as galvanized steel, you know, fails down the road, 10, 15, 20 years, you can replace the hot water basin, you can replace uh, casing panels, you know, you can replace internal structure, things like that. If it's a cold water basin, though, you cannot replace the cold water basin. It's just too much um, effort. So usually if you've got a, a failure of your cold water basin, you either replace the tower or you're doing some sort of patchwork and, and coating. So um, I would encourage you to always consider at a minimum having a tower with a stainless steel basin. Yeah, um, for sure. We I don't think we ever we hardly ever do them without stainless steel basins. Yeah. It's just a it's a very good investment. Oh yeah. Um, three sixteen, just a quick, you know, encourage you for city water, most HVC applications, that is serious overkill. Um, you know, even on the coastline, unless you're circulating some sort of very high chloride water um, or you've got a severe industrial application, 316 really is not needed. So uh, we occasionally see specifications for 316 basins on galvanized towers. And that one, I just, I, I cringe on that one because it's just not a good uh, mm -hmm. economical choice there. It's, it's kind of a contradiction, I guess, or an oxymoron. Um, FRP. Uh, users do ask about that. You know, FRP certainly has corrosion advantages, um, but it uh, obviously can burn. It doesn't meet any of the fire codes. Um, it, it's not. It's a little harder to design for high wind applications. So, as a result, we typically don't use a lot of FRP, at least in the package tower marketplace, for that for that reason. Certainly, it can't be recycled. Um, so, steel is just generally uh, the the alloy of choice or the material of choice. All right, we are on the home stretch. So we did talk about um, that piping earlier about, hey, make sure there's room for piping. So we wanna look through and discuss some of the options we have from a layout perspective. Um, you know, and this, this picture indicates why we wanna discuss it. it. Can be a busy place underneath the tower. And so just looking at different options available to you um, to select. So the first, we're trying to get water to the cooling tower. This is our dual top inlet option. Uh, the piping you see in this photograph, that was all uh, laid out, designed, supported. That's all done by the design engineer, the installing contractor. So, you know, fairly low cost from, from our perspective, um, puts more onus on, on others, right? If you do do that, we do have an HC valve there that's shown. It's kind of a nice valve for controlling water as well as providing a 90, degree turn, so popular option to consider. Um, rather than have to do all the design work for that piping and that pipe support, uh, we offer a single inlet option, very popular. Then you can you can kind of look at the uh, top left or that diagram, the dash line there, that is the piping that you would have to provide in support. So much less piping. Uh, the red and the blue sections is what we as the manufacturer would provide. Um, as you look at other manufacturers, you might want to make sure that that the piping they provide actually goes down to the bottom of the basin. Um, if you have to put pipe inside the tower as an installing contractor, not a big benefit to you. So just encourage you to look at uh, as far as what scope is required for installation. Um, so we've gotten water to the tower. Now we want to get water out of the tower. Uh, different configurations there. Very simplified diagram here. We got bottom outlet. We have sump outlet. We have side suction outlet. Um, so what are the pros and cons there? Uh, bottom outlet, very simple. Um, lowest cost for us. It's just a hole and bolt circle. Disadvantage, um, there's not a lot of water above that outlet. So it tends to be a little bit larger. So as a result, you know, again, not a big deal to us. We can, <laughs> we can make the hole bigger. That's, that's pretty easy for us to do. Uh, but that results in your piping diameter being larger. So you mm. got more costly piping possibly. And of course, you've got larger piping to figure out how to fit underneath that uh, basin. So as a result, uh, the sump option, this is fairly popular uh, because it is you know, lower down. It's a little bit easier for us to get water into that pipe. Oftentimes, the pipe diameter will be reduced. And the other benefit, it does provide you with a 90 degree turn. So there's no mm -hmm. elbow to provide. So again, popular option there. Uh, really the only disadvantage, a little more cost from us. And then you got additional joint to potentially leak. Nice. Um, last option is a side suction. This one's uh, kind of old school, falling out of favor. Uh, more often when towers were on a slab, this is really the only option they have. Um, 
it's not real friendly. You have to, uh, that suction hood that's shown there, you got to start up, you have to flood the basin, you have to vent that suction hood. So not as easy to, to start up. So this one again mm -hmm. is losing favor. <clears throat> All right, so we got water to the tower, we got water out of the tower. Um, unfortunately, those two flow rates don't always balance. And so we need equalizers to um, bring water from one cell to the next as those flow rates aren't quite the same. Uh, we would recommend using bottom equalizers. So again, a little more piping underneath the tower. Um, you can you can use valves on this arrangement. So a lot of flexibility from an operational standpoint. You can isolate the cell hydraulically if you want. If you need to get in there to do service on the basin, uh, clean out the basin, things like that. Um, so this is usually the most predominant design. Uh, the disadvantages of this one: there's a dead leg down underneath, so you can get some sediment building up. So we would recommend having some sort of clean out header on that on that pipe. Excellent. Um, flumes, this is another kind of a old school design. This is basically a, a box that's connected between cells. Again, if the towers are on slab, uh, this is the only solution you have. Um, these are kind of bolted boxes, so there is an increased risk of, of leaking. So, and, and maybe most importantly from, a, from an installer and from an owner's perspective, they're not real flexible um, from, from hydraulic standpoint. If you really want to isolate a cell hydraulically, you need to send an operator in there with his waders, put on a weir plate and, and bolt it on. So just not a real elegant solution. Mm -hmm. I, I want to cover briefly non-conforming equalizers. Uh, equalizers tend to come up during that VE discussion. Hey, we don't really want to, we don't like that 12 inch equalizer pipe. We're going to change it to six inch. And you know, we say, okay, you, you can do that, but you're just not going to flow as much water. So you're putting a little more um, importance on your uh, ability to, to balance flow rates. So as you get smaller, right. as you go to a side type equalizer, again, that flexibility just, just starts to go down greatly. So we wouldn't necessarily encourage it. Um, if you've got existing towers and that's the system they used, they were able to operate successfully, then, hey, that that's good experience. That's another reason to continue with that. Uh, but again, we would, don't usually recommend that on a new tower installation. And and one thing to keep in mind, I just want to show this, you know, which one's going to flow more water. If you've got a flume um, on the side of the tower, you've got a large cross-sectional area. If you just have a side equalizer, that's a much smaller diameter pipe. Note that these are not full of water. They are not pressurized. The only driving force is an inch or two of water differential between basins. And that's why, you know, generally the equalizer needs to be a larger diameter. And, and that's why it would be on the bottom of the tower and not on the side. So, Excellent. All right. One last slide, just a quick plug. We've talked about product selection. Uh, we did launch a new product selector about a year ago called CoolSpec. Uh, it provides guided selection for you guys. Uh, you know, many of our users don't know the alphabet soup of model numbers we have. You know, I don't know. All right, stand by for Mark's return. Hopefully, <laughs> we are live streaming this on our website, so this does happen every once in a while. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we'll do a quick um, Q and A here. Uh, we do have some questions here. You all could stand by our next. Um, there you go. Got you back. Okay. I was just waiting. I yeah, could hear no you. Worries. I just didn't. So anyway, quick plug on our product selection tool um, available at coolspec.com. Helps you with these product selections. Um, certainly your, your friends here at Insight can do all this work for you. They can do a little bit of the work for you, um, but encourage you to register um, and, and get access to our product selection tool. It was redone about a year ago, so. Excellent. All right, that is the conclusion. So now I'm- What a great presentation, questions. thank you.